thank you all for joining us either online or in person. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our fabulous media team because they're always here and they always do a great job like setting up the mics and all that good stuff. I also want to uh, give a shout out to Mary Packer, Kripa Sundararajan, and John Mainwaring for helping get the panel together and everything they've done for the Spark because none of this really would have been possible with, without their team. So um, today we're going to have kind of a panel and presentation here. Um, we'll introduce the faculty panel here in a second. Uh, we have a few questions for them. Um, and then we've got a presentation as well. And they're just talking about what it's like teaching in the Spark and what we can learn from that. So um, here we have uh, Bob Krikak. Did I say that right? Yes. With the School of Design and Construction. We have Erica Crespi with the School of Biological Sciences. And Rebecca Ellis Dotson with Department of History and R Roots of Contemporary Issues. Oh, good job. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and start with our first question to get us, um, get us going. Could you please describe your general experience teaching in the Spark? So kind of a high level um, experience. So for me, it was a great experience uh, having taught this same course numerous times. I think in, was it Healed G3, where you're in the pit? Um, this I taught in G45 that I, I call the arena. And the lighting was wonderful. The um, projection was great. The sound, when you hooked up with the mic, was um, good for everybody. And I could see, since it was only five rows deep and I could keep the lights on, I could see every single student from the center of the room. And I could also walk freely around the room, uh, which I like to do. So I, I've had a great experience in there uh, from my personal view, view of things. Hi, so I, um, I teach animal development and I taught in G10 which is the large room at the bo bottom of, of Spark. And I had taught my course before in the active learning room in Bryan 404, which was much smaller. But this particular room, G10, um, was really good for, con for allowing students to work in groups. Um, and each desk had a monitor, so students could be hooked up to finding resources um, at any time um, for whatever the, the activity or question they needed to answer. Um, so it gave a lot of flexibility to what kinds of classes we had, whether it be group or lecture or guest speaker. Um, so I think the, the flexibility of that room was really conducive to the types of activities I wanted the students to um, get involved in and kind of engage in. So that was um, the best part of, of being in Spark. And I think the students, you know, we're pretty happy in being in like one of the newest buildings and classrooms on campus. So it was a, an improvement from our previous classrooms. And I, I'm a relatively new teacher. Oh, you're still oh. <laughs> I'm a relatively new teacher. And so this, I've only had two years under my belt, but the first year I taught in Todd and the second year I taught in the Spark. And I felt that in Todd, though I wanted to do more group work, um, the linear nature of the seating, the inflexibility of the seating, you can't move them, meant that um, I gravitated to, towards more lectures because it made sense in the room. But the spark really helped me develop more of what my vision for the class was um, to be get from the beginning because I had the group setting, um, I had the I was in an active learning room, uh, several act, different active learning rooms, and um, kind of how I envisioned being a teacher was I was able to be that teacher more in the Spark than I had been able to be in Todd, where I, I felt more constricted to a certain style of teaching. Very exciting. Looks like a lot of new things happening with the, with the building. So um, next we have Erica Crespi who kind of um, walked through some questions about activities, what her class looked like in the Spark. So we'll start with kind of going um, over your presentation. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so this might be most applicable to science teachers or um, where there is a lecture and a lab associated with it, um, and how to use Spark, or in general, how to, to orient your class to maybe more active learning. Um, so I teach animal development. It is 
a class for primarily juniors and seniors that are in mostly in the pre-vet, but some pre-med, some molecular and cell uh, majors. It's a writing in the majors course, so um, there's a special attention to um, activities to kind of teach writing, um, and in this case, um, in the, the format that we use in scientific manuscripts, but also we covered writing for the public and oral presentations. Um, it's taught every fall. It's about 60 to 65 students with three lab sections um, that have different TAs teaching those lab sections. And um, one of the things that I try to do is integrate what's happening in the classroom and what's happening in the lab for a really complete active learning um, approach to the course. And so if we could change slides. So the learning goals of the course are, of course, to learn the vocabulary and content of, of developmental biology, but just as much, um, if not more, um, I want the students to learn um, scientific literacy skills um, and how to be a scientist. And up until this level of, of courses, the laboratories are kind of more um, I guess prescribed, and in my course, students do experiments, and they work through um, going through the scientific method, and they have an independent projects where they do an experiment they design themselves. So that's important, and um, obviously communicating science to the public. So there's a lot of activity around that. So if we can change that. One of the problems with um, teaching with a lecture lab format is what happens spatially in the lecture, that content often stays in the room of the lecture and in that part of the brain of the students. And what happens in the lab happen is separate cognitively and spatially um, in space and in the brain of students. And then there's like the learning outside of class that we ask them to do. And this separation um, is, is through surveys is, is pal palpable, you know, and you think you're covering the same content in two places in two different ways and they're complementary, but really the students are not putting two and two together. They don't realize that what they're learning in lecture is actually applicable to lab and vice versa. So my goal is to kind of integrate explicitly what's happening in the lecture in the lab um, so that things bleed back and forth so that knowledge isn't kind of left in one place and not in the other. So how did Spark facilitate this? Well, having that, essentially the Spark classroom for active, this particular active learning classroom, you know, it's the same as the lab, it just wasn't wet lab. You know, you know students were working in groups, they were able to um, kind of learn content that was directly related to the skills that they had to do in lab. I got, was able to teach um, computer programs or you know introduce some of the things that we were doing in the laboratory in the classroom and connect those things explicitly um, so we used um, the kinds of activities were more like common homework assignments and they had to work as groups to answer questions or discuss the topics from those assignments um, there were some group share activities where different groups had different questions that they had to answer and then share it with their classmates. Um, and short lecture followed by questions that the students had to actively incorporate that information into answering questions. So there are different types of activities. Um, and like I said, we had guest lectures. Um, and once in a while, I would use the computers to, to have everyone like share how to use literature searching, how to use a statistics program, how to use um, an image analysis program. And so it really allowed for that coordination. Um, and it also allowed time for groups to work um, from lab projects in the lecture time. I, I don't even like to use the word lecture anymore. It's the class time. and so. Um, they, they got to work in those groups. And we had some other projects not associated with labs that you know, was the only time that students can conveniently work in, in other kinds of groups on different projects. Um, I was able to, I kind of already talked about this, how I incorporated some technology in the class. It was all kind of mediated through computer um, monitors. 
Um, and students were able to use their own laptops and share what they're looking at onto the computers with this immersive solstice software. Um, and um, there was a lot of um, converting what they would see digitally to actual manual pictures and answers that they can then kind of retain with muscle memory as well as visual memory. And so I have two examples, I think, at this point. So this was um, like a flipped lecture where I essentially took slides that I would lecture about typically, give them to the students to work on, and have them answer questions about those figures. And these were all from the textbooks. And I don't know if you can tell, but developmental biology, <laughs> You're literally creating monsters sometimes in, in order to understand developmental processes. But this is not stuff that students are used to looking at at all. Um, and so really understanding these figures from the book and really incorporating the, a lot of information that's conveyed is a big challenge in this class. And um, development happens over space and time. And those dimensions aren't uh, easily conveyed in a snapshot, and we often look at movies as well. But here, you know, a, one group would have a particular question to describe this figure, and would get the main point, and then share it with the class. And then ultimately, everyone would turn these in, and this would be the study guide for, for the class. So the next slide kind of shows um, how we, we would play Pictionary. That's what somebody wrote on my comments. I never called it Pictionary, but it's taking some information, um, either from the text or from um, online, and then converting it into actual um, image, you know, drawings so that students can incorporate what they, and can they describe what they're looking at by actually reproducing it themselves. And so I use whiteboards um, extensively. In, in, in G10, they, we have roll-up whiteboards, so every group has their own whiteboard. And um, we use good old-fashioned drawing um, but I think in combination with the ability to um, have these groups working, um, downloading things rapidly from Blackboard or from other places online, um, we can get at a really efficient use of um, this kind of activity. And the students actually think that this is one of the most effective ways for them to kind of learn, is going back to, to drawing some of this stuff. Okay. So challenges, um, you know, in this particular room, here's a picture of G10 in Spark. Um, one of the challenges is really understanding how to transfer from you being the leader and having the students looking at something that everyone's looking at the same image that you want them to look at to changing that focus to group specific um, activities at each station. And um, you really have to know how to use the system to do that fluently within the space of a classroom um, time. Otherwise, things just take really long. So I had to practice that. And people had to go over these over and over with me. But I, I eventually, I think, got some grasp of that. But that, that, we're some, that technologically took some practice. And you can see there's a big screen over here. I don't know. If and so you could actually then flip to using this big screen as well. And sometimes that was an effective thing to do with guest speakers, for example. Um, the spatial arrangement of the groups is important. The way this room was set up, there was a line of monitors down the center of the room, which made it extremely difficult for me to talk to the whole group. With, um, I had to walk around constantly. And that's great for group work. Um, but when you want everybody's attention, People on one side couldn't see me very well if I was on that one side of the room or the other, or if I was at one end of the room, the opposite end couldn't see me. So it's when you needed that like focus. Um, and some of the students said it was distracting for me to be walking around a lot um, while I was trying to give them instructions. So I mean, that's something, um, if we had more of a U shape, um, that, that might have been um, a better configuration for some of the classes that I taught. Um, and then I think this is not a challenge of the room, but of active learning is that I, my activities often ran long and I have to plan them so that we can actually get through them and have that time for reflection in the class instead of running long and then trying to pick up on the next class. 
So what did the students learn in this class? I've done some um, formal assessment. Um, content is something that they learned. Um, but I think to the next slide, to a lesser extent than the scientific literacy skills. And I think this is because of the emphasis on the active, not only active in the laboratory experiments that the students enjoyed. Um, it wasn't just this tack on, which a lot of labs are in the sciences to the lecture. It was part of the whole lecture and it was actually part of what the students found most enjoyable about the class. So we picked up on that. And then we had a lot of positive change in attitudes about their excitement for science. Um, students saying that they never did an experiment before, but they never really actually like, understood the, the, the whole process before going through it. Um, and the lastly, um, we did a lot of work on how science and development affects um, a lot of issues in society from right to life to um, sexual expression and there's a lot of issues there and we were able to have those discussions pretty fully with this kind of a format of a class. And so I think Spark really enabled this integration that I was looking for between lecture and lab because of the format and it gave us that flexibility to carry over um, activities from one space to another. And I never really was conscious about the use of space in education, but I think this really hit home for me um, how the spatial arrangement of how the students are interacting and what, what's provided really does change the way information is stored in their brains and it can be accessible, or at least um, in, in my qualitative assessment of this class. Um, it enhanced my ability to ex execute um, projects that were outside of the lab so that students can work in groups and we worked on a community engagement and projects. But you know what I think a challenge is um, it did not motivate the students to do homework to come back into the class and discuss and be able to answer those questions. They, we, I, 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 that's probably more me than the classroom, but somehow I need to get them to, to do more of that um, homework in order to make the activities more effective, um, especially with timing. So anyway, that's my spiel, I think. And um, I don't know if there's anything else I need to, to say at this point. No, that was very, very helpful. Did y'all, did y'all want to comment or did y'all want to go through the questions that, um, I don't I've, have any comment. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I think, um, I think going through the questions will help a little bit. So, um, <clears throat> now more specific to, uh, maybe Bob and, um, Rebecca here, what activities did you do in class? Um, it'd be great if you could share an example of, or two of student work or verbally. So. Uh, this class was a uh, conversion of a class that had been uh, initially you know, developed in 2012 and has been offered spring and fall semesters ever since then in a more traditional classroom setting or lecture setting. And so with the G45, we tried to go completely electronic with this course. We uh, had the, it's a course of um, three sections uh, of time uh, in the semester and so each section is uh, guest lectures from uh, architecture, landscape architecture, interior design and construction management, the four disciplines that make up the school of design and construction, the intent being to um, present each discipline's um, um, what their values are, a day in the life of each uh, aspect of the profession and what current and future challenges are. So it's uh, four guest lectures on every Tuesday for four weeks, a quiz, and then four more guest lectures, etc. So we would, uh, every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, we would get the guest lectures presentation. Um, the class was at noon. And so in the next four hours, the TAs and I would brainstorm as to how to break up that lecture and how to create um, activities or engagements at about every 15 minutes. And so three um, activities or engagements 
for the lecture. And we'd put a red dot on the lecture slide to remind them to stop here uh, because there'd be a question posed that they, the students would need to um, usually write about and then discuss. And so that's what one of the things we did. Um, we also tried to use some of the various uh, tools that were given to us, but we weren't, um, we were pretty much trying to keep up with things and build this from the ground up this first time through. So I would hope I was hoping I would get a chance to teach it again, uh, but it'll be a few more years before I get assigned to this class. Um, but we tried to use those things. One of the problems with allowing so much technology, though, was um, it has, offers a lot of other avenues to escape down other than the, the presenter that's in front of you. But uh, a lot of in-the-moment writing, um, in the surveys that we would do in the moment, uh, we used I forget the name of the Google software where you could write questions about what was being presented and then other students could um, thumbs up it and, and use that as a, a method of discussion. We didn't use that too often, but I felt like when we finished this, we'd, we'd done a good job, but barely scratched the surface of how to use all the tools that were available in the room. So. Do you have any ideas? I know you said you want to teach it again. It's a few years. Do you already have ideas in your head of how you could of harness that technology to better that activity? No, I don't. I need to, uh, you know, there's this long list of different um, tools available and, you know, and I'd be like, you know, I built a house with a screwdriver is basically what I did this fall. And, and so I, I'd like to, you know, get out the other tools or look at what we did and how could the other tools that are in that kit uh, pr help me deliver the, the content more successfully have a higher level of engagement. Um, as a parallel, the same course is being taught this semester in G10, an active learning classroom. And so that professor uh, was forewarned with some of the diversions that digital access you know, for the students provided. So he banned all cell phones, tablets, and laptops in the room. And if they want to engage, they need to take notes and um, the TAs have been, who were from the fall, carried over into the spring, and they were um, noting that there seemed to be a higher level of engagement, or more retention, and you know that the class stepped up in their ability to retain the knowledge there. So that may be something else to, to bring into this. But again, I you know would like another chance at this in G45 to see how we could improve ourselves. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I teach a different contingent of students. Um, I, have a, I teach a required course for all freshmen and incoming transfer students. And so um, the students in my classes aren't always happy to be there. Um, and we're trying to often transition them from a kind of high school level of depth and analytical depth to something um, you know, where they're engaging in a kind of deeper, more analytical way with source material. And we have kind of two sets of goals. It is ultimately a history class, a global history class. So we have kind of a content. We're trying to talk about change over time in particular um, thematic sections, as well as uh, teaching a level of analytical skills, source use, writing skills, et cetera, um, in the course. And the what I found is, is that I, I've put a lot of emphasis on uh, source analysis um, in my class because um, students come in, I think, with that being the most difficult skill to master in their collegiate careers. And one of the things that the SPARC has really helped do is help me um, craft activities to help demonstrate how we get into different kinds of source material and how you how you identify what you can get out of this source versus what you can get out of this source and how to read those things. So for example, um, one of the things that I do is teach the study. Um, they're kind of inundated in their digital lives with a lot of um, study finds that, newspaper articles detailing what a study has found or what a study has not found. Um, and so we, I teach a unit or a day in which we go over what constitutes a good study, um, what is good science, what is bad science, and how does science get reported in the newspaper, what gets left out, 
what doesn't get left out. And then I have them go online and try to find an article about a study. And they have to determine whether it is a bad study, a bad article, or a good study, or a good article. Um, and then we have a whole a discussion um, about that. And, and being in the Spark, this is group work. They, get in, they find individual things, and then they share. They pick one for the group. And then we have a whole class discussion about what constitutes a good study, and how do you interpret a study finds that when they come across it. Um, and another class activity we do, um, I teach history, so I want them to use primary sources and understand how um, something created in 1935, it, what they can get, how they can understand 1935 from that particular document. And so we work with an archive, a digital archive, disabilityhistorymuseum.org, where they kind of go and as a group construct a very small in-class research project about a particular issue in disability using this digital archive. Um, and again, so they, in the whole class, they're learning this kind of history and change over time of maybe, you know, the history of institution, uh, institutions for the blind um, in the United States. And, but they're crafting the content and that change over time perspective using this particular archive. So I, I've really found the Spark to be a very useful tool in getting students to work hands on with documents and begin to differentiate between um, what things can be used for, what they're good for, and what, how to kind of reject some information and use other information and sift through all of this material. Um, and in a group setting. And that was something I couldn't do outside the Spark because of limited space. And, um, you know, when in Todd, they all try to turn around to each other and are all squished, and it doesn't really work well um, in that group setting. But the Spark has best definitely facilitated, um, and I think really improved my ability to teach source analysis in a really fundamental kind of way. Awesome. And I think we kind of, uh, through y'all's answers, I think we kind of touched on this next one, which is how did the Spark facilitate your instruction? So if you have any more um, additional comments with that. That's, yeah, I yeah. think that's pretty, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then um, going to a, a great one, and hopefully we can talk about some solutions. What challenges did you face preparing to teach or now teaching in the Spark? So as we uh, developed each days, there'd be a Tuesday lecture, and we would you know, develop the questions that would engage the lecturer's materials um, at the third points in the class. And then on Thursday, we would say this, the lecture on Tuesday was about construction management, the values of construction management. On Thursday, we would use um, various tools to support that lecture, or the content about construction management. So there were times we Skyped in uh, a recent WSU grad um, in, from their office in Seattle to the classroom to talk about what they were doing. Uh, there were other times that we had um, uh, short YouTube videos about different aspects of construction management or whatever the profession was we were, had been, that had been presented on Tuesday, and then we would create questions for students to answer in the class uh, during that period or about that video, and trying to keep them as engaged as possible in what was being projected and using their tablets or laptops to answer questions versus watch soccer or uh, other things I found people doing. It wasn't to a huge extent, but uh, you know, it was, it was there, people writing other, you know, papers for other courses, et cetera, but keeping them engaged. And, and I think, uh, you know, changing it up very frequently was one of the keys for us. It was a freshman level course, uh, UCOR arts course, and so we had a, a diverse uh, student population, and, um, and I hope they wanted to be there, right? Yeah. So. I also had the similar issue with the multi-use of technology. And I ultimately, about halfway through the course, kept said they had to have one device at a time. Mm -hmm. um, that if they were, and it couldn't be a phone. Um, and that, that really helped cut that down because we were doing so much group work that involved them 
doing in, you know investigations online and using that that the phone was where the social media was was taking place and so it would be the laptop out and then the phone out and so then just ban you know saying okay it has to be one device it must be a tablet or it can be a laptop but not a phone um, really cut that way way back because mm -hmm. the phone was the principal kind of social media outlet and when they were away the, the mice ceased to play <laughs> um, but uh, I for me the challenge was kind of I was unprepared for how much I was anticipating a higher technological savvy in the freshmen and quickly came to realize that I would be spending a lot of time teaching technology if I used too many new things and that I had to be very careful about how much new I introduced so that I didn't have spent half a class period multiple times in the semester um, having to teach a new app or a new device or you know and so I, I was very selective I think we used Mersive um, and then we used um, a little bit of Padlet and that was that didn't work as well as I had anticipated with 75 students um, and so we cut that back a little bit so um, can you explain what Padlet is for people who don't oh, know? Padlet is a it allows students to kind of post to a main screen um, and they can post questions you can and you can move their answers around so you can organize it into different categories for example um, but uh, we found that the diversity of technology that students brought into the classroom um, could be a problem Google uh, what's Google's iPad or Google's laptop did not work with Mersive for example yeah Chrome the Chromebooks that's right um, and we actually also found that Mersive, I taught in 235, and Mersive crashed after 60 students logged in. Um, and it, it crashed in 235 only. It was, it was a problem specific to that room. But after about 60 students would log in, Mersive would just give everyone pinwheels. And um, no one could then post after that. So we confronted tech, there, so there was this kind of balance in um, using technology in a way that was useful without becoming a distraction or becoming me running around the room getting everyone tech, you know, set up and troubleshooting um, a lot of problems. And so I think that was the biggest challenge was trying to parse out what's going to be useful, what's not going to be useful. A lot of things looked exciting, but how am I going to teach it? Um, Mersive was not happy with Max initially and in the first semester, and we had to kind of um, wait until that compatibility came, um, came into being. So that was, I think that was the biggest challenge, was trying to figure out what was going, the students would make sense out of, what they wouldn't, mm -hmm. and figuring out the kind of path where I didn't have to cut content and teach tech. And I, I just want to, I kind of went into my spiel before, but I wanted to just say the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. there's some using technology is great, but there's a stochasticity of mm -hmm. oh, one day PowerPoint doesn't want to talk to every computer, or this mm -hmm. monitor is broken, or not responding. Or right? so mm -hmm. you have to have some kind of like um, experience with failure <laughs> to in mm -hmm. order to know exactly how to balance yeah. and kind of keep the class moving when mm -hmm. you hit some of these technological issues, which um, I, I reduced the use of Mersive to only the students who could use, you know, who felt comfortable with mm -hmm. it. And yeah. they worked in their groups and it, with a monitor right there in yeah. G10, it was, it was okay that they, you know, used other ways to share information. But, but that was really a, a, a trick and minimizing the number of things. Mm -hmm. To, that I've used in the class to make sure that the students get mastery of using them as well and, and fluency of going from back and forth from mm -hmm. this computer to that and sharing information. Um, but you know, then there were some surprises. You know, I used this Padlet um, kind of software to you know, facilitate um, the sharing of groups um, of mm -hmm. information that they found. I, I also did like yeah. finding a study or whatever it is that, and the students jumped on it. 
Like mm -hmm. they were so fluent with that right away. Mm -hmm. And it was so much more conducive for discussion boards than Blackboard discussion, which I don't like at all. And like I've used yeah. um, Piazza for discussion boards mm -hmm. in other classes, and that's actually a decent discussion board format. But the students really got into the Padlet thing instantly. Mm -hmm. And then I realized you can use that for concept mapping. Mm -hmm. And you can use that platform. It was flexible enough to do multiple things. And mm -hmm. I didn't, ex it was like, I think I was more afraid of using it. <laughs> <laughs> but then once I put it out there, they, they, they jumped on it right away. So I think it really, you know, that was a good surprise, but I wouldn't have known that unless I yeah. tried it, right? And so I think there's trial and error in, in finding the technology that actually does work for your class, and it mm -hmm. might not be something you expect. Yeah. So did you use the tablet only in class? Well, those um, bulletin boards can be accessed outside of class as well, so they can post things that they find for homework. And, and there's No, you just have to set it up for, like, as the instructor, I set up a, a, a it's like a bulletin board, literally a post-it board. I set it up, and, and I, I didn't have, like, all the students' emails associated. I just had it public. So that made it really easy for people to use it, as mm -hmm. opposed to, like, God forbid I put the wrong email address yeah. or something. And, and they could access that whenever. I, there might be a certain limit to the number of times you use it. Cripper knows this answer. But um, before you have to start paying for it. But I, I never ran into that issue. <laughs> so I, I don't know what the extents are of all the uses of that. Um, but that, that was useful. I was, I was I, I'm going to use that. Padlet and Mercer were very different in that Padlet is, or, Immersive is screen sharing, and right. that's, that was the big problem, right. is that once you had so many computers right. being screen shared, the, the network configuration couldn't handle it anymore in 235, in that right. specific room. Other teachers used it and didn't have that same problem. Um, I was the one teaching in that room most of the day on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we experimented with it with techs on hand, and um, it the room couldn't sustain about, I think we hit about 60, and that's when everyone would start getting pinwheels around the room. And I don't know if they corrected that issue. They may have. Um, so I used it in a couple of ways. Um, one was we, we talked about quality of sources, the same kind of activity. Um, and then students at each group kind of went online and, and then posted up examples of different kinds of um, studies or they, they found in the news. Um, but also I've used it to um, facilitate um, concept mapping a little bit in that um, students could contribute different ideas as to how a process was working and then we could kind of orchestrate how those things might be related. And so it was kind of like reorganizing post-its on, on a wall. Um, so it, it kind of helped that way. But um, when we discussed um, gender and um, sexual orientation, I used it to facilitate discussion of um, some of the, the you know, responses students had to our guest speaker and some of their preconceptions and things that they learned. Are they all, is it anonymous publication? It could be anonymous, or you can make it that they have to have their name. So there's flexibility to it. Um, so yeah, and that kind of a discussion board, like I said, was they just, it was so easy to use, and I don't know, like you can insert links online to actual websites or articles. You could tack that in in your post-it. So it could actually hold a lot of information um, related to a project. And you can organize like different parts of the screen for different parts of that project too. So I mean, it, it seems I'm learning new ways to use it um, as, as I go along. But I, I was just um, surprised that everyone was jumping on on how easy it was to use, and it made them want to contribute in some way that I felt like the discussion boards don't. 
I think the successful tech is the ones where it mirrors or is familiar to something that they're using regularly in their daily lives. And I think Padlet mirrors a lot of the social media type posting that they do in a variety of different um, apps. Um, and I like f we did a group project, and I am not a f I don't like PowerPoint, um, and so I had everyone work with Prezi, which is an online format that is really very similar to working with PowerPoint, but is online. It's accessible. They're creating something that's public. Someone could Google their presentation and look at their presentation, um, and uh, they can and they can all work on it together. In their, you know, they could be in separate dorm rooms working on the same Prezi and discussing it with each other um, from afar. So it required them being in the room less um, together. And because it was similar, because it was something they recognized as very similar to PowerPoint, it was an easy transition to get them to use. I didn't have to do much you know, tech, tech teach to get them to use Prezi. And I think Padlet is similar. Is It's recognizable. Right. And, and the function of it is, feels familiar. And so you don't have to do a lot of teach. It's when it starts to cross into something um, that's less familiar that you have to do a lot more kind of teaching. Um, they're not, they're, there's not a kind of a savviness or a, that they're not going to kind of instinctively know how to use stuff that isn't familiar. Yeah. Padlet has great support as well. So I've used Padlet um, several times. And one of the things I like is they, they release a lot of updates. And so recently, I think this semester, you are now allowed to draw on Padlet. So there's a doodle feature. Oh, you feature. can? Yes. Mm, so well, just good like, for me. Just a few weeks ago, because I, you know, I teach math, and so I had them draw visual things. And so some people had touch screens to use, um, and some people just wrote it down and then took a picture, but it's really flexible that way. And then one of the things I didn't like is that you can't organize in folders. It's like, look, I, I like Padlet, so I use it a lot. I want to organize it. And they responded within 24 hours and said that, the, that they know that there's been a request and they're working on it, so it might be out Where's soon. <laughs> so, but they responded to me and they're, they're, very, they're very proactive that way, so. Do you know of any fees associated with it? For Padlet? For Padlet? No. Okay. Um, the premium features is, uh, I don't remember what you get with premium features. Oh, one of the things I know is you get extended, um, what are they called, uh, the backgrounds? Yeah, the <laughs> different built-in board backgrounds. I know, I keep telling myself, don't pay for pretty backgrounds. So the premium plans, um, you can have a private network, manage users, enjoy more wallpapers, store bigger files, and you can have a custom domain instead of Padlet.com. But... So um, going on with the challenges, uh, hopefully, uh, we talked about a few. I tried to write them down. From the three, one of the things is going from group work to central and back and forth, like that transition. Just transition. The, um, yeah. And then the same, this kind, you know, kind of in the group work as well, um, and individuals, the media distraction, having multiple devices. Uh, in general, the spatial arrangements and then tech savviness. So I guess the, the best question here is, do we have any solutions? Have y'all found anything that has helped at least um, kind of tackle those challenges? For me, Kripa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The help that's provided, I think there's help whenever you need it. Um, and it's just acknowledging when you need help and finding the time to get to it before um, I spent a lot of time with her before the class started because I was really nervous. But, you know, I think there's, that, that's a big solution to it. And I feel so much more comfortable now. Mm -hmm. I guess this would be a good time to mention that, that academic outreach and innovation is up in, in Spark 102B 8 to 5. So basically there's either an instructional designer or emerging tech there that can help us. And, we don't always have the answer, but we know someone who has done something, and we love brainstorming and, and helping y'all fit those needs. Sure. Thanks for the shout out to Kripa. <laughs> I'm sure she's sad she's not here. I think if I'd have had um, the time to move from Daggy Hall, just go across the street at 9 o'clock after. Uh, so we had seven TAs, and so all eight of us would brainstorm for an hour about what to do that day. And then from 9 till noon, the lead TA and I would put it together. And thinking 
back, it would have been uh, nice to have moved over to uh, the Spark and have had, you know, Kripa or someone at the table with us say, you know, this would be a good opportunity for this tool or, you know, but now that we've built it once and, you know, I think just to be able to take the class, that rough draft over and, and get some suggestions from one of the academic outreach consultants ahead of time and, you know, look to ways to improve it in that respect that would uh, be really beneficial. So having, if I'd have had the luxury of preparing every class a few days ahead of time, I would have uh, reached out to that resource. I also asked my class a couple times, like, how, okay, so this seems to be an issue. So, for example, the spatial arrangement, because 235 also has the wall of monitors dividing mm -hmm. the classroom, which really cuts down on the ability to have a whole class discussion, because the little girl with the very quiet voice over in this corner can't be heard, you know, on the other side of the table. Um, and so st I asked students, you know, like, okay, so this is an issue. How are we going to solve this? How are we going to solve this as a class? And they, they suggested they stand up, you know, and I felt it was a little formal. It seemed to work um, in its place, but I think too that sometimes um, students can be creative and they're experiencing the issues. And so I think sometimes um, going to them and saying, all right, so we're having this problem. You're, we're having a social media issue. We'd like you to have your tech in the classroom. I'd really like you to be able to work with your laptop that you're comfortable with, but I also don't want you shopping <laughs> while I'm talking. So how do we solve this problem? And is it laptops closed while I'm talking and everyone takes handwritten notes? What's the solution here? Um, and I was, I've been genuinely surprised. I sometimes will create discussion boards um, and post a problem and say, okay, here, I'm having this problem. Brainstorm with me. And sometimes, sometimes it doesn't yield much. Sometimes it yields um, a creative solution I hadn't really thought of. Um, and just because they're on a different wavelength than I am. And yeah, so I, I, mean, I think that's another, another option too. I think you just helped me with Monday's lesson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more um, comments on the challenges and or solutions? Um, I have a, a question. I don't remember what the last question was. but um, So my question for the Spark and technology. So what level of technology use do you all really see as um, I could not have done this at all if I was not in the Spark or this technology room versus this is just really cool. It has made my class more efficient, both for the students and or myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think for me, uh, I could have done this in other classrooms, but the layout of G45 helped me feel more in touch with the students. And we literally did this entire fall semester paperless and 263 students, um, everything from their final paper, their quizzes, notes in class, responding to questions posed, was done paperless, uploaded to Blackboard, and the TAs were able to access it 24-7, graded at their convenience, no papers were lost. Uh, I mean, it just, uh, it really, on the management end was wonderful. And I could have done that elsewhere, but I don't ever feel like um, the other rooms had the capacity or I, I just you know, wasn't ready for it, whereas I was with G45. Uh, I, the layout of that room, I'd teach anything in there. It just, <laughs> for two, with 263 students, it, it felt as intimate as you could get. And um, the ability to you know, see everyone clearly, no one was up in the darkness. Um, it was. It just had a nice feel to it all around. So, uh, the layout and you know the capacity of the room helped a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think technology aside, what was inspiring and what could not have happened with my class was this continuity in in learning between two different kinds of environments where one was really active 
obviously in, in doing lab work, but this was active in thinking about that lab work and thinking about what it means and what are we actually studying and having the facility to have group work um, and modularity and flexibility in what we do in the class made that possible. Granted, it was nice to have the monitors there for various types of activities that I felt like were, were really good, but I really feel like, um, yeah, I guess that was number two. <laughs> you know, like having the monitors, the portal into the internet or to Padlet or um, to the assignments or whatever it was, um, that obviously added to the breadth of the kinds of activities that we could do, but without that, um, you know, structure of the classroom, we couldn't do any of the, the active work. So I felt like that was really important, most important. And I can echo that and I can add to it. So my husband actually also teaches in the Roots of Contemporary Issues and we all kind of taught in active learning rooms and he taught in one of the flex rooms where he was able to move the tables in any configuration that he wanted. He could put them in a circle one day, it could be U-shaped, um, they could be in group work. Um, and the, I really loved the group work aspect. I thought, I thought most of the tech I could have done in another way and made it work with a lot more work on my end, but, but still I could have made it work. But when he talked about what he was able to do in terms of discussion, in class discussions and changing discussions by sh reshaping the room however he wanted to shape it. Um, that was one of the things that is available in the Spark that uh, we hadn't talked about that I would love to experiment with at some point in time. Um, in that, you know, you, there's, diff there's many different discussion styles that can be kind of competitive or mo in motion discussions that if you can rearrange those rooms, you can do that kind of stuff. And, um, I, you know, that's one thing that we haven't talked about, but that I think I holds for the future. Um, the idea of a kind of completely mobile classroom. That's one thing I, um, the active learning, the monitors do do, is they do pin those tables down in a particular for configuration um, that the flex rooms don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that, uh, the Spark offers all of these different kinds of, of teaching styles, um, but the key being it, all, it allows activity, it allows motion, it allows, um, uh, you know, student-centered kind of uh, activity. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an active learning it space. Active learning. It does, mm -hmm. um, in a way that I don't know that the other spaces do as well. Brian, maybe. A little bit. Well, Brian, for for with that U shape, I wish I never. When I I had a review session in mm -hmm. the U shaped yeah room, and all the students were like, "Oh, I wish we could be yeah. in this room." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I mean that that's a better for for my class. That yeah. would have been a better. The wall of monitors is a difficult yeah. is difficult to get and, around. And, and, yeah. So I don't know how people could have like envisioned that when they designed the room. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's oh, like why a, they didn't put the podium. I mean, I know why they didn't put it there, but I would have wished they put the podium in the middle. In the middle. In the middle. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the windows over there would have been, I guess they didn't want to block the, the screen or something, but I really wish they had put the podium between them. You know? Yeah. You know, and I had to learn. So you don't have to kind of move all the way here to see, because half the seats are blocked from the room. Yeah. Yeah, either I had a TA. If I, if I were doing like a single um, PowerPoint or something that I want the students all to see, the TA had to sit there or I learned Mersive. So I could just do it from my, mm -hmm. my pad like a, and kind of go through it. But I had to walk. I never stood at that yeah. end of the room. It, it was, was impossible couldn't. to interact with the students. So. Well, I teach programming, and so I, I met my keyboard, and it's really hard sometimes. I, make, I deliberately go over to that side of the classroom on occasion, but since I'm doing so much um, keyboard, which, which is another question I have for you, Bernie. <coughs> in G10, I have a lot of issues. I taught in G10 last fall. And one of the things that really bothered me was having my back to the students a lot. Because, and then I deliberately tried to turn, but it's very difficult for a lot to turn around. So I actually suggested that they have a, some sort of a pedestal that actually turns 360. 
so that you can actually you know, have cords that somehow like come down <laughs> and then, you know, go all the way around. Because when you when you're working on a speed like that, that's really hard. And, you know, when you you can't turn. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have that issue? No, we um, <clears throat> we weren't tied to the podium. Uh, much we mic'd up we had the remote slide changer and and we walked and when I guest lectured in G10 this spring the same thing I had my remote and I I just did yeah. serpentine through there um, that is really nice. in the last phases of the design of uh, the spark we did consult with the design team on a um, a mobile podium that was kind of like a segue. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. it, it had a, a gyroscope in it, and you could put your laptop on there, and it had a, uh, it, everything in that. So with just um, touching the bottom of it with your fingertips, it would move with you around the room. It wasn't, you weren't anchored to that spot in the floor. And uh, hopefully we'll get to pick up on that uh, and prototype it a little further. But it was, it was the idea is that you've got this very, fluid classroom and yet you're anchored with uh this podium design which wasn't really thought out as they designed it so mm -hmm. it, 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 it's tough as they say when you when you are trying to do a lot of stuff with the keyboard mm -hmm. and you're you know showing the examples and you're doing the main things and whatnot um, it's really difficult yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah and, and a couple of students pointed it out in the midterm evaluation Always seeing your back. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are others of us behind you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I tried to detach from the, you know, if you were a podium lecture, you're not going to do well in G45, right. you know, but I wasn't, so I just, uh, I used my nervous energy to help me pace and, yeah. and <laughs> constantly turning around. And I made sure I was always mic'd up because my voice would carry well in one right. direction, but not the well, other. The Yeah. Because I was saying, yeah. I'm doing a little bit better now because I'm just an eye clicker, and so I do have to pull myself a little bit more, but still. Oh. Oh, another thing, I'm teaching again this spring, I'm teaching building codes in um, the Spark in one of the active learning classrooms, and it's much more effective there with the students being able to look at that screen versus that screen, mm -hmm. and they seem to be more engaged and pay, drill down further into the content because I'm. I'm putting up, you know, seven different sections of the building code and tables and a floor plan, and, and they they find it easier to work through the content that's right in front of them than the big screen. And then I use the big screen to go up and point things out um, for the whole class. But I really like teaching in the so active you're, learning. You have monitors and big screen. Yeah, <laughs> and so that that works out really well, and I'm, I really like what that has allowed me to do and then they I like that they sit together in groups of six five to six and they um, you know they help each other out you know they, they help it's you know building codes are complicated and all these exceptions and they all remember enough parts of it to mm -hmm. help the group through so oh I find it really funny because I'll have a table with six and then I'll have another table with two and what if mm -hmm. they spread out a little bit more <laughs> no there's six and there are two yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I've heard a lot of, um, I went to one of the um, workshops where people were sharing, and I was amazed at how many professors engineer that no, no two groups are the same each class. Mm -hmm. They really tell people where to sit. Like, I am loath to do that other than in, like, you know, occasions where there's obviously, like, way too many people here and there's nobody else. Like, could you please move over? But, like, I, I try not to engineer Mm -hmm. who the groups are, but then there are professors who explicitly know that, you know, you don't want to have like that, that group of friends are clicky and then they're not paying attention or they want people to know everyone in the class or, you know, they, they have really like, re they engineer the groups very much. So I experimented a little bit last fall with, with both letting them self select and with letting myself with myself selecting and then also with letting Blackboard establish kind of randomized groups. And I have to say, I didn't find that much like 
statistical data. I had, you know, a couple groups that were off task, whether it was self-selected or whether they were, you know, randomized. There was a couple groups you had to kind of like, all right, guys, let's, let's focus. And um, regardless, so I, I don't, I've gone to self-selection because I haven't really seen a tremendous difference in the number of groups that stay mm -hmm. on task versus in a controlled setting versus mm -hmm. a self-selected setting. You know, I, uh, this, I'm teaching, this is a freshman class and for the most part, and nobody really knew each other, I don't think, at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the class period. And I suspect that they're all sitting where they started, and mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain comfort, and I'm, in this, I'm a Lyft fellow right now, and mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has participated in Lyft, but there's the whole idea of social belonging. Mm -hmm. And so I now feel like they feel comfortable with this group. They feel kind of like, well, this is my, my group, and I feel, you know, that here I am, and mm -hmm. this is my group now, and I want to sit here, and I don't want to sit there. And so I just leave like, me, right? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and this helps them. They feel comfortable. They feel like they belong in that little group, so leave it there. Yeah. Right? But, uh, but, you know, in my case, a lot of the good, but the better students sit together, and the students who are less engaged sit together. Yeah. And oh, well, yeah, but my, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying in, in my mm -hmm. class. Yeah. So well, I tried to mix. Class, right? Yeah. And one time I tried to mix by doing the personality thing because, yeah. you know, I took leadership thing where, you mm -hmm. know, like I wanted lions and golden mm -hmm. retrievers and owls. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted the mix of personalities because people weren't really talking. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out my, almost my entire class were introverts. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they weren't yeah. interacting. But, um, but anyway, like I, I, I think it would help if I engineered some of that grouping mm -hmm. a little bit better. But um, I just there's so many other things that I'm worrying about that it, yeah. I just kind of let it go. I, I there's a distinct difference. I, so I teach one version of the course, which is a 75 student TA'd uh, freshman, and then I teach another version, which is predominantly transfer students, 35 student capped. Um, you usually students who are coming from maybe four years of community college experience, they're older, they've re-entered school, they have a diversity of backgrounds. And there's a real difference in how those two different groups react to group work. Um, the freshmen sometimes function better in a little bit, with a little bit more control, a little bit more um, movement because some frictions can develop and having, allowing them to change up groups or shift that over the course of the semester a couple of times helps things settle. Um, and I find the, the smaller class setting um, with the older students, uh, they really do well when they settle in because they get comfortable, they, start, they have a mode of discussion, and they really um, open up over the course of the semester, the less you kind of, I guess, monkey with the system. Um, but it's, it, it's been... This semester I'm teaching all of the small classes, and last semester it was all of the big classes. And I feel like the two, it's a really distinct really difference. So, so one of the things, speaking of the six, uh, uh, you know, per, so one of the things that I found that when I give exams, it's a little, bit, a little problematic when I give an exam. I've been trying to see, I see them, but you know, they're so close together at the six seats. Did you, how have you? I, for exams, I, I, after the freshman year, our interior design students are oh. in the same group of 24 to 38 for the rest of their time here. So they're pretty familiar with each other, and I'm familiar with them. So I'll, I'll tell them to you know, redistribute at their desks. And then okay. I've been using Blackboard for my quizzes. I have Blackboard randomize the questions and randomize the answers to the questions to help out with that. Yeah, so, yeah, when it's programming, it's a little bit harder. You're actually having your right. coding and reading. Yeah. Y'all have been kind of hitting it, so we're kind of in the recommendations for future instructors in the Spark. So, and this is our last question. So, if you have any any last uh, recommendations before we uh, close out. Hmm. Know yourself as an instructor and know what you're going to be comfortable with and then maybe stretch just a little beyond it. 
take baby steps. Yeah, baby <laughs> steps rather than jumping full, you know, full headlong into uh, a whole tech world and um, maybe get to a comfort level and then take a step. Right, or get a grasp on what kind of active learning you want to do and then mm -hmm. incorporate the technology. Yeah. Um, I, I think one thing that I needed to do was sit in the classroom when it was empty and just kind of get inspired by what I can envision could happen in that space. Because otherwise I just was kind of limited, like this was mm -hmm. especially when I first started. Um, I was limited to you know what I knew, lecturing and stuff like that. So like I needed to kind of like really get inspired by the space actually and see what I can do with the students in groups that would be more effective than lecturing. I think one of the the most important things to do though is to to seek help from the innovations group. Mm -hmm. And there are so many ideas for activities, more ideas than I could absorb really. Mm -hmm. And you know, I had to come to them in my own time almost mm -hmm. to see how that fit into what I was trying to teach. But um, there's just so much help, but you have to, you know, make the time to do that before. Well, I had a um, basic idea of my content and how the room functioned and some of the, a few of the tools that uh, were used. And now that I've done that, I would, you know, go back to the um, uh, as people who could assist me with using the broader range of tools. Here's what we did the last time. How could we uh, broaden our use of tools, create higher levels of engagement um, using these tools? That's what I would, uh, if I, so if I had taught the class in a spark situation or knowing the, that room, I've you know, taught it in more traditional rooms, but um, you know, now if I go back and do it again, I'll just take, kind of take my lesson plan in from the last time and, and see how here's where we could use this software and this, this, this tool, that tool, the other. So. And then I'd ban all cell phones. <laughs> I know, this is incredible, like your comments on that. Wow. So I have a question for you about the use, effective use of I haven't used it much. I ended up leaving the students to choose if to use it if they wanted to. Um, few did. Yeah, I think I, I left it up to the groups because there was always somebody in the group that felt comfortable to use it, or some groups more than others, but if they felt fluent to like shift what's on the common screen with their, what's on their personal screens, and there were certain activities where that definitely would be optimal, but otherwise they just turn their laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because we were in groups, you know, that they just looked at each other's screens and we didn't have to use it. Um, so I think it, it serves, a, it helped me because I was able to run my PowerPoint off immersive and I could walk around the classroom. That's, I mean, like, that's how, I guess that's how I used it, yeah. I mean, I, I used it so I could pull up Prezi, share my iPad to the screen, and then I could just lecture and, and move everything how I wanted to. Uh, Why couldn't you just use the computer? And move around. And continue to move because I can do everything on my yeah, iPad. Yeah, I can forward it. I can open things bigger. I can go in and I can be talking and moving around the room at the oh, same time. You weren't tied to the podium. Okay, so you're using the iPad and sharing. Yeah, and then sharing the iPad to the big screen instead, so that I wasn't tied to the podium. Yeah, you've got. I had I had a mix of students too. I think I had one group that used Mersive to share. But everybody else used Google Docs because mm -hmm. everybody could go in and work on it. Google Slides, Google Sheet, whatever it was. Right, right. Um, they could all see it and work on the same thing and see where everybody was. Mm -hmm. um, Mersive Solstice was nice to share when I went to like a third party software that they wanted to show and do things. Um, the, so like show mathematical blocks and things. Right. Um, that was nice. But, um, and for me, I used the clicker to go around. 
I guess it would have been nice for Immersive, though. I ha I did a Kahoot game, and so I have to be there to click it. So I would always I'd always forget and have to go all the way back to the <laughs> the podium to click it. So that it might have been. Uh, it's a it, it's a it's an online game. Yeah. It's like it's a, yeah. kind of like um, Top Hat, or where you can have questions, mm -hmm. but it's more fun and it's supposedly easier. I I just saw Kahoot this past. It's some, more fun. It's a game. It's a it's a competition. It gives you points for being correct and how fast you are correct. Yeah, that's like Top Hat does that. Like, but um, but that's like for, you have to the you students have to, have to buy it and all that. Mm -hmm. But you know that yeah, that's a level of. The other consideration to consider for things like Mersive versus Padlet, um, I me personally, I always default to Padlet because I automatically upload it into Blackboard and it is now a review piece for them. Yeah. And they can go mm -hmm. back to it. Oh, so, so you can, how do you, how do you? You can put the link into Blackboard mm -hmm. and it's there. I or actually you can download it. it. Uh, you can also so embed so it directly in. in what sense? Is it image? Is it no, it's live. It's, in, it's, in, it's an embed code. So you could, or you can just click it and it takes them to that link. So Padlet's a web-based bulletin board, if you will. So you save each page. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a separate URL for each page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, could, you can export it as a PDF as well. I, don't, I yeah. haven't, but. We should sit down and do it. Yeah, let's do it. There's a <laughs> lot, yeah. We, 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 if you look, so I guess we'll so close. You really, you really, so what do you mean? So I've used it in several ways. One, I've done it like a chapter jigsaw. There was a lot of really big key concepts. Um, we talked about the connections. I didn't end up using it as a concept map with Padlet. Um, but you can do different layouts. So I'll do like a shelf. They call it shelf. It's a fancy word. So basically, it's a column. And so they would post things and answer a specific question under here and then mm -hmm. do another question under here. And then they can go and review theirs, um, like it, ask questions. Like, you're not clear here. I don't know what you're talking about. Because mine, I'm teaching future teachers. So it's very easy to throw an activity of, now put your teacher hat on and go grade somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so Padlet's very good about um, having that out there. And it's very low stakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, Bob, Erica, and uh, Rebecca, for taking your time for this. Uh, we. Uh, li.wsu.edu. Um, our learning innovation site has a lot of information. The Spark has its own website. If you ever want to go look at 360 views of each of these classrooms that they're talking about, that might be helpful. Um, and then, uh, as you all mentioned, AOI is a great resource, whether you're in the Spark or not, really. Um, and then um, we have a lot of tools like Padlet listed online. But thanks again, and let us know if you have any questions.